All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm sure there will be a few of our Slowpoke friends making their way in, but I'll, I'll get the party started. We have an incredible panel of speakers tonight. I'm Maddie Stokes. I'm a board member um, of the Baltimore Museum of Industry, actually a newer one, and I'm really proud to be able to introduce such an important topic tonight. We are thrilled to welcome all of you to the first program in our Workplace Matters series to explore contemporary issues in industry. Tonight we'll hear from Donna Edwards and Gerald Jackson of the Maryland and DC AFL-CIO about unions and their role in worker safety during the pandemic. I'm personally really excited about this topic because of course at the heart of important industries that fuel our economy are the workers that, that power them. These stories are often untold and are especially elusive when we look only at the stock market, only at the numbers, only at the CEOs. And it's an especially important conversation in Baltimore where we've seen such dramatic economic transitions. And now with the onset, onset of COVID and important calls to even the work playing field, workplace culture and protections are now more important than ever. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, our museum is inside a 19th century oyster, oyster cannery and we are located at the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. If you haven't been, you must go. It's open, people can go and walk around. Um, by, the, by the water there, it's gorgeous. We are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Programs like this one that we're attending all tonight is made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and of course donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you so much. And if you'd like to find out more about becoming a member or making a donation, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org or reach out to us directly. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're having tonight. I'm gonna to do a few bits of housekeeping in this virtual world before we begin tonight's presentation. Uh, the discussion is being recorded and we will post it on the museum's YouTube channel, channel in the coming days. Feel free to share it with friends and family. Um, your camera and microphone are turned off, but we really encourage you to participate you can use the Q&A feature along the bottom of your screen to submit questions to the presenters. Let us know if you're having any technical difficulties in the chat function as well, we're happy to help. Um, and we're gonna really try to keep this thing on schedule and let you all off to enjoy the rest of your nights sharply at 8 p.m. So um, without further ado, I am super pleased to welcome Dr. Kate Jabinski as the moder moderator this evening. Dr. Jabinski is a lecturer of Gender and Women's Studies and the Director of the Women Involved in Learning and Leadership program at UMBC. She re received her PhD in Rhetoric with a Graduate Certificate in Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies from the University of California, Berkeley, which where is actually where I'm from and where I am tonight with my family, a little far away from home in Baltimore. And she co-edited Baltimore Revisited, Stories of Inequality and Resistance in a U.S. City. And now, over to you, Kate. Hi, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I was part of organizing the Graduate Student Union at Berkeley when I was there and we were a part of the AFL-CIO. Um, ah. This was many moons ago. Um, so we are in the presence of some legendary leadership tonight. So I'm really excited to introduce um, our, our two guests tonight. First, uh, Donna Edwards is a trailblazer and pioneer for women during her 40 plus years of activism, advocacy and organizing. She's the first woman to be elected president of the Maryland State and DC AFL-CIO. She was a social worker, a strategic planner, an administrator for Baltimore City's Department of Social Services from 1977 to 2001, where she was a stalwart advocate on behalf of all working families and low-income families. She received her Bachelor of Science uh, her Bachelor of Social Work from the University of West Virginia, her Master's of Social Work from the University of Maryland, and completed the Labor Relations Program at the Harvard University Kennedy School. Uh, and I learned uh, previous, uh, earlier tonight that she has been the president of her local since 1984. That's a really long time. Age, age me out. <laughs> no, <laughs> never. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Gerald Jackson Sr., who was elected the Secretary Treasurer for the Maryland State and DC AFL-CIO in 2017. He is a 40-year member of Steamfitters and Plumbers UA Local Union 486. In 2012, he was the first African-American elected as a full-time officer in the Steamfitters and Plumbers Local 486 in 108 years. When I said legend, wow. that's what I meant. Wow. As Secretary Treasurer of the State Federation, Gerald represents our unions on 
task forces and work groups, developing legislation and policy, ensuring workers' issues are addressed. He testifies on bills in front of the Maryland General Assembly and city and county councils that are important to not only unions, but all working people. And I know that as a faculty member, I am not allowed to unionize, but I benefit from the work of union, um, union folks all over the state. He's a labor representative on the mitigation work group for the Maryland Department of Environment. Uh, and we're gonna hear a, a lot from both of you tonight. So I wanted to say thank you for joining us and I'm really excited to hear from you. I was hoping you could each start by sharing a little bit about the um, issues y'all are working on right now um, in this time of COVID. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invitation for us to do this. It is really, really exciting. As I've said, when, when you guys reached out, I've been to the Baltimore Museum of Industry many, many times, lots of fundraisers and events, but just to know that you are really doing deep dives into workplace matters, that, that just is so exciting and great for our community. So we really, really appreciate it. Uh, I know that we want the, to get into questions. We wanna hear from the people who have um, you know, tuned in, let's say. So I don't wanna belabor, let's just, I will highlight two important things that the Maryland State and DC State Federation is doing. And by the way, we have over about 700 local unions affiliated uh, representing all 55 of the international AFL-CIO unions, as well as some of our independent unions. So we're very proud of our membership and the activism. Every single union has just been able to do so much heroic work since this pandemic hit. And we've learned to work very quickly, very differently, addressing a multitude of our workers' problems. And not just our members, it's their families, it's their communities, and it's people who don't have a voice through a union. So we're, we're out there everywhere. The state has, has really been um, on the forefront and has, so has DC. So let me just say two important things. One, in May, over 100, about 100 of our labor leaders, uh, state and national leaders that live in Maryland, we sent a letter uh, into the administration here in Maryland um, asking them, requesting them to issue an emergency temporary standard to protect all workers from COVID-19. And we made a list uh, of what essentially would be in there. And, you know, we got input from all of our unions representing public employees, representing healthcare, representing bus drivers and postal workers and hospitality, entertainment, construction, everywhere you go. So it, it was very inclusive. Uh, Virginia is the first state to have issued a uh, statewide COVID protection for all workers, and we're still working with that. The coalition has grown and, and we're very pleased. And the second thing is that the AFL-CIO has launched a website that is really set to uh, increase any worker's awareness on what is a safe workplace, what it should look like, how they could work with their coworkers to demand some things of workers. It's called Am I Safe at Work? And it contains fundamental information that will empower workers uh, from every level. It identifies key COVID-19 uh, tool, tools and guides and you know, what can I ask? What kind of protection should I have? So you can go to our website, which you can find through um, Maryland State and DC AFL-CIO.org, or you could go to the AFL-CIO.org and uh, get either one of these tools and get the information in the update. I'll leave it at that. There's so much more going on with that. Great. Thank you, Gerald. Okay, I'll jump in. Uh... Having Donna go first is always the worst thing because she covers everything so thoroughly. Um, in my position as a secretary treasurer of Real Estate uh, AFL CIO, I have to um, I had to change. Uh, you have to wear many hats. And, I, and my area of expertise is actually uh, the building trades and construction. So um, I'll start with that. After the pandemic hit, I, the first thing I wanted to do was contact my contractors to see what their COVID-19 response plans were. And um, each of them sent me their, their plan. And uh, it, was, it was uncharted water, unprecedented 
trying to protect construction workers on sites that are traditionally the the uh, uh, how can I say it the petri dish as far as bacteria and viruses and and just it was it was a mess. Now I'll say I'll say this that the pandemic has changed the behavior on construction sites for the better as far as implementing um, hand washing stations, things that most of us take for granted being in the office. A lot of our members uh, don't have in, in the construction field or, or on, on a construction site. Um, so moving forward, everything had to be changed. Um, we had to have ways to sanitize our tools. We had to get PPE. Um, we had to find, we had to change the way we gathered as far as on the construction site, everyone's in a trailer, but now everyone can't be in a trailer at the same time. You have to um, schedule it through shifts and try to maintain social distancing. We had to find out, we had to um, communicate with our contractors to see if masks were a part of PPE or since it was state mandated, should we provide it ourselves? And, and just trying to work through all the kinks of, of, um, of the issues or the concerns that the pandemic brought about. So that was the first thing. The next thing is um, having um, workers on, on federal sites, we also have a different set of rules because on federal sites is where you have the um, Family Cares Act. And the Family Cares Act came into came into being, um, I'll say, around 2017. So now my guys who are working on federal sites wanted to know if they were, if they were eligible for um, time off, paid time off, and everything like that. So a lot of uh, interesting conversations came about because of the pandemic. Um, the pandemic has has been an horrific event for the for the country. Um, I hate to say that something good came out of it is is the way um, construction sites are going to um, be going forward as far as cleanliness and and trying to um, just clean up a, a hundred years of just uh, filth. So um, that being said, uh, that's that was my immediate um, reaction to the pandemic is trying to see is trying to make sure our members were. And all and all construction workers were were um, in in a, in a, in safe conditions and stuff like that. Great, thank you both. Um, all right, so here's a, a question that uh, we wanted to discuss: How do workers weigh the risk of protecting their own health or that of their families with doing their job during the pandemic? What factors go into this calculus? What's the role or stance of unions in negotiating? that risk calculation on behalf of workers? Well, I would say, first off, workers have more security if they are in a union and demanding a safe place to work. Uh, there is by law, employers are supposed to provide a safe working conditions, a safe place to be free of hazards and health risks although some jobs are innate with that, and you know going in. But it, during this pandemic, there, I'm sure there's far more employers that don't know how to do that and everything that it comes with it than there are of those that just have refused to do it. Uh, I think that this urgency to reopen that we're seeing is also um, doing that at, at the alarm of endangering not just workers and the public, but also some businesses. And I think also this, the push that we're getting from businesses also to have, you know, to be, um, to have protection against liability also might have a slippery slope in not providing adequate protections during COVID for the workers and for the um, public. The thing that really, you can re be fired for refusing to go to work, but I think we saw very early on, a lot of workers have really weighed that 
between their health, their families, and the job. And they, they walked with their feet by not going back to a job that they felt might be hazardous to them. And you know, people shouldn't have to choose between safety on the job and a paycheck. That's just, that is just not American. It's not the way that we fought for this country and moved it forward. So there is a right to a safe workplace. There is a right to demand a safe workplace. And uh, I will tell you, even on that toolkit that we just talked about, it gives uh, even a spreadsheet of how to track hazards that you've seen. Uh, you know, for instance, somebody walking into the store refusing to wear a mask, what date, what time, who was told, not having hand sanitizer or they're all empty, not having PPE if you're supposed to have very close contact with the public. Not, all of that is trackable, traceable, and needs to be reported. But it's also something that's not one and done in, in a lot of industry. And we see that even in our institutions, okay? We've seen it here in Maryland at our higher ed. Um, there's a lot going on that is not being told. And I think you'll ask another question shortly about you know, some hidden workers that we don't see often. So I don't know if Gerald has additional comments. I do. Um, once the pandemic hit, the, the governor deemed a lot, of, a lot of the different construction sectors as essential workers. So with, with, with not knowing the effects of, of the virus and how it's going to affect everyone and their families, a lot of construction workers wanted to be laid off. The contractors on construction sites have, have, a, have a, an agreement with the owner or the general contractor to finish the job at a certain time. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was kind of a tug of war from guys saying, listen, um, I have um, elderly parents or grandparents or I have a wife who's expecting and, and, and just the unknown of how the virus could affect everyone. Uh, it, it was a fight. So um, it was very hard to try to navigate, trying to get, the, trying to get guys to clean layoff and not have them quit and not have any any conversation at all. Um, it was it was very uh, contentious early on, but as it as it went on and, and people got more comfortable with what needs to be done to protect themselves and their family, um, things kind of worked themselves out in that way. Um, like I said, in, in construction, you have uh, you have deadlines where you get fined or whatever. And, you know, at least with maybe having us sued by the contractors because our guys were leaving us site. And it was just a, a conversation based around uh, getting a job or well, business with loss of life. And that's basically what it came down to. And uh, like I said, it, it took a lot of um, long, hard conversations. And eventually the, the, the contractors came around to the, the realization that um, the lives of the employees and their families uh, outweigh the, the bottom line. So that was, it, it was good to get to that point where we could acknowledge that and work with it and then work within the boundaries of what we had. So. Right. Um, there's a question, I, I have other questions to ask, but there's a question um, related to this that came through in the chat. Um, Sarah asks, uh, I have a question about asking for hazard pay and COVID safety without putting our jobs at risk. The job market in my field has totally shut down and my colleagues and I want to ask for better protection and hazard pay, but are afraid that the job market is just so bad that we don't want to risk being fired. What would, do either of you have any, any advice about that situation? Because I think a lot of workers are facing that. They are facing that. And I will tell you during this time, we actually are having a lot more workers reaching out to ask what union could represent me or who, where could I get advice? And I would say, first off, always make sure that you have a group of your employees together, that you don't go one at a time, that you go together, that you document what is hazardous, what's happening to you, that you reach out to the labor community, reach out to us, um, and find you know what union could give you better advice and, and give you the help. And uh, we go forward. I mean, 
many of our industries are just completely, well, I don't want to say abolished, but they're being Im immobilized. The hospitality is down to like 20% of the employment. Uh, when you look at uh, all of the entertainment, the theaters, et cetera, they're trying to figure out a way to reopen, but it really is going to take quite a lot. I mean, even if you protect the audiences, how do you protect the actors on stage from being six foot apart and not having you know, a mask on? Um, all of these things have become very hazardous. And so I, I would definitely say, you know, don't go it alone, do it in a group, all of them, but also reach out and reach out to the labor community and see what help we can give. Yeah, and we've got a comment coming in through the chat from William Barry, another legend. Hi, Bill. Um, if you're worried, get organized, not just advice. You have to get a union. The difference between union and non-union is so clear in the discussions tonight. Jill, did you have anything um, you might add to that? Yeah, what I was going to say, I saw William Barry's um, comment, and I, I, I really appreciate the comment. Um, Recently, we recently we've been on a uh, an organizing um, an organizing uh, campaign of a contractor, and um, it went to a vote. The NLRB had to uh, had to be there to monitor the vote and all. And I was surprised that it went down. The, the employees decided that 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 they did not want to be represented by us, and uh, I was. I was shocked, really. So that being said, it's, it's, it's very hard a lot of times to get people to want to change their life because the, the company or the employer puts a lot of pressure on the employees. Anti-union rhetoric saying that, listen, once you join the union, you're going to lose this, you're going to lose that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a fight all the time trying to organize. And even among my my members who are organized, being that this COVID is, is like I said, it's uncharted water, it's no precedent. Everything we're doing now is developing a precedent, you know, for if this thing continues or if something else comes up. And, and a lot of my own members are, are afraid to challenge the norms because it's, it's, it's just, it's frightening, man. When you ask a contractor, I, I don't feel safe. And the contractor may say, well, you can leave, you can quit. And a lot of times that's the option. And, uh, and a lot of workers are faced with it, union and non-union. So that's some of the challenges that we face. And Kate, I will tell you that we, we've we also heard, and, and even some county of execs have brought it to my attention, that non-union, and, and particularly in, in the construction field, and, and that literally people who are sick are being told to show up anyway, or you have no job, don't report it. Um, so that, that's what we're dealing with when you have, you know, workers that are really afraid and in this economic time and God knows the, the economy that's going to come even after we find a vaccine and start moving out of this, there, we have to help people feel empowered. You know, your work, where you go to work and getting a paycheck is should not cost you your life and yet every in april every worker memorial day we have to announce how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of workers in this country have died because of workplace injuries and so and now we have COVID, and they don't even want to consider that a workplace injury yeah, yeah that's a, actually a good segue into this next question um so some frontline workers, such as doctors, have been in the news a lot lately. Um, what kinds of jobs are getting less attention but are just as risky? Who's doing that kind of work and how are they compensated and protected? Because I've noticed that, that some people are called essential workers and, and others not so much. You know, it, it really, this, you've hit a chord here with me that, that has been agitating me since day one. Yes, we, we called everybody heroes. And of course, our medical professionals, our nurses, our doctors, our CNAs, everybody that was faced right with the person that has the illness and the disease uh, coming in. But you don't see the person who is keeping the floors clean, keeping the building maintained, keeping the cook in the cooking. We haven't 
even talked about our essential employees. Everybody loved going to a 7-Eleven and seeing some person so that you could get your Slurpee and think there was some normality. And yet this country still is fighting to pay that person $15 an hour. But they were essential to us, our normality during that time. Our bus drivers weren't, they were still driving and seeing the public all the time and you know had quite a lot of problems uh, getting in contact with COVID. Our postal workers who on a daily basis now were having cases shown up. And then, you know, we of course we have the whole funding, but when you test positive and you need to quarantine for 14 days, somebody should be there to take your route, but they're not. And so there was so many other people in the back in, in hospitality. It, and now as restaurants open, Yes, you can see the person coming towards the, at the customer, whether or not they have on a mask. But what is really happening to the workers in the back who have been bussing the dishes, who are you know, chopping the vegetables? Do they have protections the way that they should? There's an entire unseen workforce that didn't get heralded as the heroes and are not compensated and are not paid for it. And we need to recognize that and make sure we understand that. Yeah. Carol, do you have anything to add to that or did Donna cover it? Well, it, usually every conversation Donna covers it. Um, <laughs> so, like I said, as far as, as my real area of expertise, it's more, it's more uh, on the construction side. And, um, you know, just seeing that you have so many different crafts, and I'll give an example. There's a lab being built at Towson State University. Beautiful building, but it was over 500 construction workers there. And we had a, a rash of, of illnesses run through the, you know, run through the site. And um, being deemed essential, like I said, I mean, the, the, the university was the owner and the contractor expected our guys to be there no matter what. And uh, I, I, I've had quite a few guys who were um, who were affected by by having COVID nineteen, and you know it's 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 a horrible thing to go through, you know, and uh, like I said, it's um it's it's trying to equate whether I should go to work. I have to I have to protect my family. I have to support my family. So it's it's um I guess it's unprecedented. It's a, uncharted waters, and and every day we're trying to figure it out. You know, the way to protect the worker. And, and and protect our employers too. So um, we, we have to, you know, kind of wear two hats, protect their interests along with protecting our workers. Right. Um, are different unions making different kinds of decisions right now about how to advocate for their workers? They have to, because we represent all different sectors of work. Right. Um, you know, there, there's so many, it, when you look at, say, I mean, like I said, in hospitality, they, they really are struggling trying to ensure that, and I don't want to put it this way, but that many of their members can hang on. Um, they are getting creative as far as, uh, you know, funds and being able to have food drives and, uh, you know, find other types of work to do and activities while um, they're trying to work through this mess and ensure that people still have some, some health care and, and benefits. Um, other, other unions have to, are driving at the fact of not having PPE available, um, you know, and making sure that the hospitals, the nursing homes are doing the correct reporting and providing the help and services they need. When you come to, you know, our ATU, our amalgamated transportation, they definitely are facing the issues of uh, low ridership. And what is that going to do even for moving forward as far as their membership, but as far as the public? How do you get the public back to work if they feel like being on mass transit is unsafe? And or that several lines have been canceled or postponed at the moment and so low work to work what do you do um when you still have you know your state workforce i mean nothing shut down in the state things started working remotely 
but you still had social workers doing visits with children and we had food stamp workers and TCA workers having a 600% increase in their work, in the applications, and they still got them done timely. And our unemployment workers were just yeomen getting all of that done, and they did. And I wanna say that that's where you had the unions helping unions, because uh, as the as the industries were shutting down or even, you know, construction and people having problems getting their unemployment or getting like, you know, temporary food stamps or temporary cash. It was the AFSCME unions that were representing the state employees that were stepping up with individuals who said, okay, call me and I'll help you get through this. We'll work through this. And so, you know, there's, so if you're if you're public employee, you're trying to deal with the local elected or the state elected to get resources, not just to continue to do the quality services you've been doing, but to also serve the public. If you're in the private industry, like Gerald, they're working with their businesses and contractors trying to to get things you know back to smooth. I know that um, even within our casinos, our unions that are there have worked to help casinos open, you know, and, and they've worked well with listening to the union and bringing the, the union to the table and the workers to the table. Frankly, the ones that I'm aware of, cross-section, all of our, you know, industries, the industries or the businesses or the company that chose to involve the union and its workers in how do we get this right, how do we come back, how do we start, how do we go forward, they are the ones that have had the most success, and you're not reading about them in the papers. Yeah. Yeah. This 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 pandemic has has decimated a lot of um a lot of our workers. Uh, it's I'll, I'll say as far as the state employees with not having the revenue come in, the state employees are not being compensated the way they should be. Um, every place I've gone everything's closed down and, and starting to open back up. But I, I'll say as far as restaurant restaurant workers, the ones I used to see on a daily basis are no longer there. And it's just, uh, I, I don't know. I just, I know we need, we need help from the government, whether it's state or federal level to help, um, to help fund uh, our, our members as far as, I mean, and not just our members, all workers, need assistance right now. I mean, all workers. And being in the union uh, is good, but unions fight for all workers anyway. You know, it's not just union workers. The one thing union workers have is a collective bargaining agreement, but there's nothing about protection for COVID in the collective bargaining agreement because it just happened. Mm -hmm. And those things are being worked out uh, every day. So this I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people are, are really suffering and, and, and have been hit so hard, man. So um, we have a lot of work to do, you know. Yeah, Samuel Epps notes in the, um, in the chat, overall 90% of local 25 members are still laid off. Don is correct. Hospitality is still totally devastated and the industry may not return fully until 2022. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of state workers um, you know, I'm a state worker and we haven't, um, like it hasn't hit us yet, but the, the, that cut in state revenue, is all going to roll and, yes. and hit everybody. I mean, every worker is affected. We have a question from, um, Janet Novak. How is the general public being educated about our hidden workers? Through programs like yours right now. Uh, we try to get out in the press these stories, and uh, we were pleased to see the, the story on our request for COVID and the coalition that is working on the emergency temporary standards. But even with that, um, I had, had talked to the press maybe a month before that came out. So just trying to get this information out as much as we can, uh, it's, it's what people pick up. It's like a lot of people assume that the University of Maryland was shut down, and yet there were people on campus. There were students on campus at College Park, and the housekeepers had, and they had no protection over there, none. We were, we've asked me fought all summer trying to bring that awareness. And, and the truth of it is, if it weren't for the union, that group of workers have no one fighting for them. 
And so legislators from that area have been helpful. And we just are trying to get the word out as best we can. And it, it's really an uphill, it's uphill to try to get the public to be aware of what is really happening with all workers. And I would say that it has hit the state workers. Um, obviously with an increase of 600%, being totally understaffed for the last seven years uh, is, has been a deficit even in to try to get out of this hole but they did. And um, the workers did a tremendous amount of work and continue to do so. Yeah, there are glaring disparities between workers and, and the rich. Um, as far as the rich have, has the, the rapid testing and everything they need to, to be protected from it. And workers are just um, considered, you know, expendable. And uh, it's, uh, it has to change. And, and all workers have to unite. And I believe that, I mean, you know, unions are good. Our non-union brothers and sisters have to organize also because we need more protection now than ever before. Um, it's, 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 really, it's really coming, it's, it's always been this way, but now you can really see it how how different the rich are treated compared with workers and it's um if it does nothing else i hope it um it help i hope it galvanizes working people you know? yeah and i'm noticing that it's exposing a lot of fault lines that a lot of us knew were already there but it's like COVID is a collective problem but right. like a lot of universities that's my sector um uh, they have testing protocols for faculty, staff, and students, but they don't include contract workers who are a lot of like food service and um, and housekeeping in that testing protocol. And and but we're all we're all working together. So I mean, we have yeah, there's a lot of work to do. We have a couple questions coming in. Um, Joseph asks, are efforts being made by any local or international unions to include COVID protection provisions in collective bargaining agreements? Oh, I'm more than sure they are as the bargaining, collective bargaining agreements run for X amount of years, anywhere from two years to four years. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are for one year just with an opening for wages. It, there, there's a complication to it. But as they can open up their bargaining, they will definitely be dealing with the COVID. Um, and what we can, and like Gerald said, it was brand new. Uh, probably, you know, we didn't expect this to happen probably should from here on out. And that's why we keep pushing getting uh, temporary standards because this probably isn't the last one that we will have in this lifetime. No. And we've got to learn from it and move forward from it for it. And um, yes, uh, we're definitely moving towards that. And again, there need to be stronger rights for workers to be protected on the job. We've seen that uh, over the years that it, it really has kind of decreased in accountability of businesses and, and industries and the protection of workers. And they're, they're sliding through and under the current administration nationally, uh, several re requirements of reporting have now just gone away. So we don't even know what is happening in a true sense of injuries and illnesses caused by the job. Uh, certain hazards now don't have to be told to a worker. So this is the time for us to stop that bleed, turn it around and put back on the books what we didn't have and what we need from this point forward. Yeah. Um, just to follow up with Donald on that, as far as the collective bargaining agreements, most, um, owners or corporations or contractors dread open it, opening the agreement back up. Uh, I, know, I know my contractors do. So it's, um, every day is, is something that I kind of keep a log of, of what changes need to be made because these times are different. And it's, you know, concerning PPE and, and um, you know, being able to have my guys laid off in, in lieu of quitting and you know, just all, all of the complications that 
that have arised because of COVID. Uh, it's like I said, as a as a organization, we were totally unprepared. I mean, just didn't have any idea of how devastating this would be to the workforce, and and not just to the workers, also to the companies, because without them, we don't work. Mm-hmm. So so we try to go into this as one and not us against them, and and having that having that attitude it kind of loosens them up that that we're not trying to just beat up on them you know um i love to have the contractor input on 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 things that can be done to make the job safer and that's where we are you know it's uh we have to work together it's 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 it's, it's no choice you know we have to work together yeah i think the point that you made earlier about how we are going to be setting precedents here is is really important. We have a couple um, other questions coming in in the chat. Walter asks, um, uh, do either of you have any comments on what's happening to the, how this affects the entertainment industry? Oh, it's really, I, I, coming here, it, it's at a, an opportune time here in Maryland where we had like about a seven year fight to really establish the film credit uh, in order to be able to have more um, series and movies shot in Maryland and be able to compete with places in the Southeast. Um, and then to have this hit and for our theater workers and you know our Otzi and our SAG-AFTRA, it, they're also, I mean, they're just at a standstill in many places, but it's really interesting because there's, a lot of talk going on with their nationals of even how to do some virtual viewing. Again, though, that requires a, of plays and uh, entertainment, and but that requires how do you protect the actors? How do you how do you really protect the actors? You may be protecting viewers and and those you know that really want to to be in the arts and theater uh, field, but um, so. We're looking to also, you know, they're probably at the same place that our hospitality is in. Um, the hospitality unions really have to wait out at this point when there is a trustworthy vaccine and most of us will take it. And we have about six months of trial and error and thinking that we are safe to travel. So we're really looking at August of next year before people feel like they are safe to travel and they can go out and do and think about being in a theater, watching a movie or watching a play, sharing your armrest. That's a big deal. Yeah. And so, but how do we keep the actors? I know, I mean, um, Tyler Perry just did it and he filmed uh the whole new season of one of his series but he put them in a bubble it cost several million dollars and testing 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 mm-hmm. yeah yeah I, i'll tell you something that i i didn't bring up and i'm, I'm going to bring up now is is the the mask wearing and i believe that it's an, it's imperative to wear your mask but a lot i'm not sure if, if a lot of the masks are designed to, um, to get rid of your carbon dioxide and allow you to breathe in good oxygen, you know what I mean? So I have guys on, on, on construction sites who are working in, in masks all day long and temperatures exceeding uh, 100 degrees heat index. And it's, 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 it's been very challenging. And I don't know if the N95 masks are, are suited for that, um, if you wear some, any kind of respirator, you need to have some kind of pulmonary test. So a, a lot of things are, are are coming about because of this, because of COVID. Not being able to assemble um, has has really just it's not to use the word over and over again. I can't think of anything else, but it's decimated the entertainment industry and everything else: entertainment, hotel, restaurant because you can't assemble. And I don't know how to get around that, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, those things are, have just challenged us and we, I, I don't have an answer right now. Yeah, I don't think anybody has, a, yeah. has an answer. Yeah. You know. 
We have another um, question here from Miltonia asks, what specifically would you do differently based on the lessons you've learned over the last six months? Have you learned anything that you'll sort of take forward um, in this advocacy and organizing? There's probably, if I sat down and did, you know, the, the two sides of the paper, I would probably mm -hmm. come up with a lot of things that we could have done differently but it, it hit us so new. And oh, yeah. I, can, I can give di examples of, we, we had no idea of the magnitude this was going to be. So all of a sudden, you know, we had a lot of sick people going into the hospitals. The hospitals didn't have enough equipment. And Gerald hasn't mentioned it, but many of our contractors, the signatory contractors with the unions, gave up their N95 masks to the hospitals, donated them by the thousands because they didn't know it was gonna hit the construction industry. Yeah. Like we just didn't have a sense of where this was going from the very beginning because we didn't have the, the correct information from the top that this is going to just swarm over the entire country and all of our workforces. Um, I think that we would have been far more prepared uh, for a pandemic had we even been thinking about what do you do if something would ever hit. And I don't recall in, in all of my history of ever having those kind of conversations within the union or even within social work, because I'm also, you know, I come out of social work. And so I just think we were so ill-prepared. Uh, I'm not gonna say we were unprepared because uh, we reacted on a dime right. and learned how to do so many new things quickly and, uh, you know, changed even, you know, how we address people and get out to our members, et cetera, and the rest of the, the uh, workforce. I think what we really need to do going forward is look at how this is going to change work. But more importantly, we have to, as a country and as workers, demand that we produce these things that are needed during a pandemic, the supplies. To think that we had to wait on other country to get supplies to us, it was frightening. And it, it's just not what we need to do. And I can tell you that we had union manufacturers who had always made clothing that within a three week period were able to turn it around and start making face masks and shields. So, um, but those are the things it took so long to get other industries able to even provide hand sanitizer. And so going forward, we have to say that we need a, an entire industry and production done in America so that when these things happen, we're not relying on other places to bring it to us and you know, long wait times. That was the scariest, most frightening thing to learn is that we didn't have it within our shores to provide our workers with a safe working environment. I, I think if anything could have been done differently, and I don't know, I don't know that COVID-19 is gonna be the last of these kind of viruses or pandemics, um, being able to coordinate on construction sites where you can work more shift work, not have everybody there at the same time. Um, the contractors or owners may have to employ uh, a staff to sanitize, um, to keep the workers in the field, but, but, but have a staff to sanitize tools and sanitize the area and, and just provide as much PPE as possible um, because everyone's concerned about well, who's using this tool, you know, before me or after me or whatever the case may be. And just, um, you know, having your, your jobs tooled where everything you have is yours as far as PPE and everything else. So I think going forward, um, those things are going to have to be put into the contractor's bid. It's, it's going to cost a little bit more to do business, but it's going to be worth it to save lives. So Really well put. Yeah. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, if you have a question for our panelists, please go ahead and type it in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Anyone has a question? I'm a teacher, I'm really good at waiting for somebody mm -hmm. to say something, so. <laughs> if, 
of Cato, I like to say if anyone uh, knows of a of workers who who want to be organized, please reach out to us, and uh, and we can send someone there to talk to the workers and and take them through what has to happen, the procedure to to turn a company around and make it a a, a union company. So, especially in these times, that's, that's very important to know that you have um, th those resources available to you. Great, thank you. Um, Lance asked in the chat, are you surprised that MOSH has not been more active? No. Is that short and sweet? But uh, no. <laughs> and um, our MOSH is, you know, a state agency under dollar. And uh, for a couple decades now, it has really been totally understaffed. There are not even, there's a handful of inspectors for each one of the divisions. And it is, uh, it, it would actually take um, 137 years to inspect all work sites in Maryland with the um, inspectors that we have on the work site. So that's one of the things that we do talk about a lot is that we, we really need to beef up most. And I think this is one of those places where we should do it. This is an opportunity for us to be talking about that going forward and what should it really look like and how, what should the powers of it be? Uh, being that it is a state agency, uh, sometimes it's even hard to get it to uh, inspect another state agency. And uh, if it does, um, to do anything that you know would cause a lot of harm or, or bad publicity maybe. So um, we, we do, we, we lack. I'm not surprised by it. I wish that we would have um, far more interest in making sure that we now take this opportunity to put in place some real standards for dealing with a pandemic and uh, for dealing with workplace safety and reporting and, and not intimidation of workers who are trying to report a health, a health safety problem on the job, which actually in the end saves money for the businesses. Because if they let it go, it will only eventually happen that someone from the public will get harmed or a group of workers will be harmed and trying to hide it instead of address it and appreciate workers to be part of the partnership you have in making the business go forward as a good business and, and as an accountable business. Worker, we're not against businesses. In fact, if there's no businesses, there's no workers, and then there's no unions and no, no membership. So it's not an us against the business community, by no means, but it is against people who want to ignore harm or disregard the value of the worker. And I just wanna to say too, if there are people that are out there looking and, and Gerald brought it up that there is this, this is showing so many divides and it is showing the divide between the haves and the haves. Mm -hmm. And the haves love to say, oh, don't go to the union because it's, there's just big bosses. They're just the big union. They're stealing your money, they're taking it. Well, I'm the first woman to ever be elected in this position. You heard Gerald was the first African-American to be elected in his position at his local. Do we look like big union? This is what it looks like now. This is who it is. It's you, it is the worker. We both come out of decades of work, real work, not being staff persons that were educated just to do this job but the grunt and the grind of being workers. And that is who the labor movement is. It's each and every one of us. And for those workers that are listening that may not have a union, you can go to that AFL-CIO website, look up, you know, uh, am I safe at work? There is a way to fill out and get contacted back. That's from the national, they'll come through us, or you can just go to the Maryland State and DC AFL-CIO and contact us and, um, because we're not alone. And, and unfortunately, in this isolation of the pandemic, so many of us felt like we were alone. And that's the strength of the labor movement, is that you're never alone. So <laughs> we appreciate it so much. Yeah. 
Um, we have uh, two more questions and about four minutes, so uh, I'll go ahead and ask those. So William asks, are there concerns about a greater push towards automation in certain industries, for example, more self-serve kiosks in the food service industry or something similar? This, this is another conversation, and Kate, I will go ahead and say the, the museum can ask us back for a conversation that really would then talk about how COVID is going to change the workplace. It's mm -hmm. been changing, but I think that we're going to see um, some major changes. Uh, some jobs may not be there. Other jobs are going to pop up, and uh, how we have transportation going to and from even uh, when it comes to our businesses that are in just like the consultant, are they gonna really need office space anymore? Are we gonna have an issue with some empty spaces in our cities now? Um, all of that's coming. And I think there will be a change, yes. Unions have right. been on top of that. I need to let you know that the, in 2017, we started uh, the future of work. Uh, with the AFL-CIO and all 55 of the unions, and uh, they are on the forefront of looking at automation and, and the future of work and where we're going and, and really following the work and training the people to do that work. Great. Yeah, I think that because of the pandemic, just going back to the old adage, necessity is the, the mother of invention, um, different industries have spawned off of it. Unfortunately, the ones who, who the pandemic has negatively affected, a lot of times can't take advantage of the new industries, which are, uh, it's, 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 it's just hard to, it's hard to transition a lot of times. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, things are gonna change forever, the way it looks. I just, uh, I can't see it ever going back to, to normal. Yeah. Um, all right, we have uh, one, time for this one last question. Jane asks, about um, your thoughts about the interest of companies to avoid liability vis-a-vis vis vis COVID. Like how, how um, companies are like trying to get us to like sign things like we promise we won't sue, things like that. Are you seeing that in your industries? We're seeing that all over. And also, I mean, that's the major push at the federal level. And I think you'll see the push here at the state level to get laws passed that, you know, they, uh, don't have liability for the COVID issues. And that's a slippery slope. And we understand, I mean, you don't want a small business to go out of business because they did everything they could do and a customer came in and, and just lied or, or wouldn't, you know, wear, did whatever. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to see that then impact the rights of workers in being, you know, demanding that they have a safe workplace and being given the tools and the equipment to keep them safe at work, even from COVID. So it's a slippery slope and a long conversation, but it's happening. Yeah. yeah. The first thing my contractors did was, was lawyer up. They wanted to see what they were liable for. Um, and eventually, eventually the conversation came down to doing what was right. Um, you know, stop trying to absolve yourself of any responsibility and not be culpable because these are your employees, our members. Uh, we work together. And uh, so it, it kind of eased up some, but as a business, that's their main concern. I mean, can we be sued for this? If, 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 we, tell, if we tell an employee, look, you have to quit, you can't be laid off, do we have the right to do that? So uh, a, a lot of issues came up because of COVID and it's, it's a daily, I'm, I'm, I mean, every day we're working on them. Yep. So. Well, thank you both for uh, your daily work and also for joining us tonight. I see one more question in the chat, but it is eight o'clock, so we're gonna end it right on the dot. And this is hopefully just the beginning of more conversations like this. I mean, I know lots of us are having these conversations in our own sectors, but uh, right. I'm gonna kick it back to, um, to Maddie and uh, BMI and say thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together and have this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks thank for having you. us. You were a great moderator. Oh thank yeah. You. Hi, Ani. <laughs> Hello. So um, let me, I can uh, share my screen and share a few other upcoming programs. Um, I'm Ani Gellis, I'm the Community Programs Manager at the BMI. Um, 
So hold on just one second, but thanks to everyone for joining us this evening and thanks to Kate for moderating and all of our wonderful panelists for sharing. I think it's just really timely, um, interesting topics and I'm so glad that we're able to, um, excuse me, sorry, multitasking here, um, bring industry from the past into the present that we're talking not just about what industry was like in 1885, but what it's like in 2020, I think is, um, is really of interest to a lot of different folks. So um, hopefully you can see that screen. There's a few other exciting happenings that haven't been finalized yet, but I will be sending an email um, probably tomorrow with a link to the YouTube video and some more information. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.